Welcome everybody. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the sacramentals, which flow uh, pretty much from what we talked about a couple weeks ago when we talked about uh, the Mass in the book of Revelation. And so uh, we'll be on the sacramentals today, and then we'll move on to the sacraments themselves. So let's go ahead and begin, as always, by placing ourselves in the presence of the Lord and just quieting our heart and our mind and focusing all of our attention on Him. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ever-living God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come together as people of faith and to learn more about the great gift you have given us in the incarnation of your Son, which has spread itself through the power of the Holy Spirit to everything in this world. And we ask, Lord, that we'd make use of the sacramentals that your church has given to us to help us along our journey of faith to finally reach the goal of the kingdom of God. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let me pass out the handout for today. So today we're going to be talking about sacramentals, not sacraments. Um, things like holy water, blessings, all the kind of things that sort of connect to the sacraments but are not... Uh, directly the sacraments themselves and to kind of understand what we're talking about started last week um, or a couple weeks ago we did the mass in the book of revelation we're doing it in sacramentals and then even more so in the sacraments later is um, we kind of have to have an understanding of um, how the bible views the creation Um, the worldview that comes out of, of sacred scripture is that um, the technical word in Hebrew is worlds, olam, which comes from the word halam, which means concealed. We can't see the reality. We don't, that's why everything is revelation, has to be revealed to us. We exist in what is called the lowest world, that of action. And the world of action is different than all the other things that God has created because it possesses at one and the same time a physical part and a spiritual part. Um, as you go up the levels sort of higher and higher, the angelic hierarchy is the way to God, um, each, one, each one gets more quote unquote spiritual as it goes up. Um, but all uh, it's funny that the Jews refer to this as action because all the action in creation takes place here. Once you break this barrier into the other worlds, um, there is no action because there's no more free will. Once you pass this world and you see God as he is, there is no more choice. Like You cannot not choose him. So everything has to occur here. And so this... Um, it's referred to as the, the other side we talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago everything in the physical world has a spiritual counterpart right? that's why we have quote guardian angels all these things everything in this in our world is just a shadow a type a image of what the spiritual world is. And so the whole point of, of humanity is because we are the only creatures that can exist in both worlds at the same time, or body and soul, then it was always our vocation to unite these two together. Now that failed, and so the whole process of the story of salvation is a continuation of, of this storyline, right? Uh, Put to have exercise dominion over the earth, subdue it, um, guard and tend, tend the garden, all these different things. And so ultimately Christ has to come, who is himself literally both the physical and the spiritual and the highest level it can possibly be, which is God himself, that he unites in this perfect, um, this perfect whole. And it's from Jesus that everything we do as Christians 
flows from. And what theologians refer to this as is the incarnational principle. And basically, what, in, in a very summary, simple form, what the incarnational principle is, is because God himself has become a, a part of his own creation, every part of creation now is infused with a divine presence. There's nothing that's not full of God in this world, nothing. And so that was always true because God is present everywhere, but in the incarnation, he literally moves beyond just a spiritual presence to literally becoming part of it. So because of that, everything that's material, water, oil, bread, wine, people, becomes a, ve a vehicle, a power for God's presence to manifest itself and to act in and through. So you have um, this whole idea that underlies the importance of the physical world, the physical realm. In fact, it, it's kind of interesting because what Judaism caught on to first and what is then proven in the incarnation is even though our physical universe is the quote lowest, it's the best. It's what God is looking for. And so what God is, is trying to do is to, as we see in the book of Revelation, unite heaven and earth as one. So this background is important because that's why sacraments are important. That's why uh, the sacred scripture is important. Everything that God does, everything, is a union of human and divine. So if you look at it as sort of a chart, we have God the Father, and he sends Christ, who is human and divine. Does anyone remember the old, like, Baltimore Catechism type definition of a sacrament? Very simple one-liner. A visible sign of an invisible grace. That's exactly what Jesus is. He's a visible sign of the invisible God. So in Vatican II, Christ is actually referred to as the sacrament of God. In a sense, Christ is the primordial sacrament. But then everything that flows from Christ will fill that as well. So we are the church. And the church is both divine, because it's the body of Christ. It's filled with his Holy Spirit. It was brought about by the will of God the Father. And yet it's completely human as well, right? It's in its... Um, filled with people like you and I, good, bad, and indifferent, that make it all up. And then flowing from the church then, let's just look at two of the things. Well, on one hand, we have the sacraments. The sacraments are also human and divine, because on the one hand, the sacrament gives us real, invisible, divine grace, and yet that grace only comes to us through visible signs and words. So the sacraments flow from this principle as well. And then think of the sacred scriptures, right? We call them the word of God and they are the word of God, but God didn't write a single word of them. Human beings did. So everything kind of flows from this whole idea of the incarnational principle. And that helps us a little bit understand why things like sacraments are so important. Why Catholicism, as opposed to most other Christian um, denominations, except for the Orthodox, why do we put such an emphasis on physical things often, right? Relics and images and statues and all these kind of things. And a lot of it flows back from this idea that God is seeking to unite heaven and earth as into this one united whole. That was what human beings were meant to do. Now the king has come to do that, but he still leaves the church with um, the same rule that was given to Adam, that was given to Noah, that was given to Israel, and that is to go out and transform this world in preparation for the king's return. So the second thing is the physical plays a much more important role in, in all Christianity, not just Catholicism, but especially you see it in Catholicism. Um, blessings, 
If you think of the Old Testament, the laws of purity, what you're allowed to eat, what you can touch, things like this, um, the laws of holiness, are all very concrete and earthly. They're physical. Right? You transfer power physically. So how does a pope become the pope? How does a bishop become a bishop? Ordination, the laying on of hands, right? There's a transmission of power, but it has to have this physical component to it. So this sort of brief summary of kind of the importance of the physical, the incarnation being the source of it all, kind of helps understand a little better like what things like sacramentals are. So the, the talk's in two parts. The first part, we're just gonna talk about what sacramentals are. In the next part, half of it, all I brought some little examples of just some of the sacramentals that can be. So the first question, going to page one, is let's start right at the beginning. What is a sacramental? Okay, what is that? Most people are probably familiar with the term. If not, a sacramental is not a sacrament. What is it? Well, Vatican II, which is um, the most recent council of the church, defined the sacramentals this way. It says, quote, Holy Mother Church has moreover instituted sacramentals. These are sacred signs which bear a resemblance to the sacraments. They signify effects, particularly of a spiritual nature, which are obtained through the intercession of the church. By them, men are disposed to receive in the chief effect of the sacraments and various occasions in life are rendered holy. So in this definition, there are four things that will really kind of follow the rest of our discussion. The first one is sacraments are sacred signs. Unlike the sacraments, the sacramentals, do not convey grace themselves. They can only point to it and help you reach a state where the grace flows more effectively. A sacramental only signifies something. It signifies something sacred. So holy water signifies your baptism, which is a sacrament. But holy water, putting on your head, does not give you grace in and of itself. More is required. And what more is what we'll talk about is how these things get empowered. But the point is they're signs. Notice they bear a resemblance. The language the church uses is trying to make clear the, the very distinct, the big distinction between sacramentals and sacraments. They signify effects. Sacraments cause effects. And the sacrament causes the effect whether you believe in it or not. If you receive the Eucharist, you've received the body of Christ. You don't believe, doesn't matter, you still received it. It may not do anything for you, but it's still the body of Christ. Your belief or not is irrelevant to the sacrament. It does what it's supposed to do. Sacramentals are different. There's going to be a lot more required of the person in using a sacrament. Sacramental, sorry. They really should have picked a different term. But anyway, <laughs> um, it also tells where they come from. Obtained through the intercession of the church. The sacraments, as we'll see, were founded by Christ himself. The sacramentals are instituted by the church. The church decides. So there is no list of the sacramentals because the church can make one up whenever it wants. There have some, been some that have lasted through history a long time and some that go right back to the very beginning of the church's existence, but... Generally speaking, the church can determine a sac what's a sacramental whenever it wants to, and it does that often. Um, whenever new um, indulgences are put out, whenever a new chaplet is okayed by the church, whenever any of these things occur, they're in effect using their authority in which when you use any sacramental, the idea is it draws its possibility of power from the fact that the church includes that in their power of intercession. So the sacraments are these sacred signs. Notice they dispose us to receive grace and help us to sort of sanctify all the different things in life. Now, if you think it's confusing now, it was more confusing until the 1300s 
because until the 1300s, everything, the seven sacraments, every rosary, chaplet, holy water, exorcism, funeral rite, all those were all together called sacraments. All of them. And only in the 13th century did the church decide that it was in order to not have to explain the difference between these sacraments that were the powerful ones of Christ, what we today refer to as the seven sacraments, and all these other sacred things the church did, they, they make a distinction in names. So that's why the term sacramental comes about. Now, clearly, it's, it's related to the term sacrament, and that's purposeful to highlight the fact that all these things that we use, candles and holy water and um, blessed salt and different things, are connected to our life of worship. In other words, they kind of extend the power of the liturgy into normal life. Right? Um, and the term sacrament itself means oath. So a sacramental is a little oath. <laughs> um, in the Bible, the term used is mysterion, where we get the word mystery. And even today, um, especially in the Eastern churches, Catholic and Orthodox, but also sometimes in the West, you'll hear the liturgy and things like that referred to as the sacred mysteries. Um, because that's the word that's actually used in Greek by Paul and such. And then as the church continued to evolve, and we'll talk more about this in the sacraments, these two words came to re 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 represent different parts. The mystery came to re represent the meaning of the inner grace, that invisible grace that you receive. The sacramentum it became known to be the visible outward sign, which is an oath. You're swearing an oath to God. You're, you're com connecting yourself more closely to the Lord. So the term sacramental means oath. It came, as many of the early church language did, right from the Roman culture. The sacramentum was the oath taken by the praetorian guards to protect the, the Roman emperor. So the church takes that word over and makes it into, um, connects it with the Hebrew understanding of people making oaths and swearing oaths. Now at the bottom, I kind of highlight this a little bit on, on footnote six of page one. I point out that uh, prior to the Middle Ages, the term sacrament was also used for rites, prayers, and objects other than the seven sacraments. Not until the 13th century did the church draw a clear distinction between sacraments and sacramentals. Um, and that's where we got a more specification of what all these different sacred actions and objects and stuff we do. Now, to understand the sacramentals, the main type of sacramental and what is involved in every sacramental is, is something more fundamental, and that's called blessing. We hear the word blessing all the time, but what is a blessing? Well, when the church consecrates and or blesses persons, places, objects, activities, she is carrying out the command of God both from the Old Testament as well as following the example of Jesus in the New Testament. And in one of the big themes, if you will, or golden threads, they call them, that run through the whole Bible, is this idea of blessing. In the beginning, we see Adam is blessed on behalf of the whole human race. Right? He blessed them. Be fruitful and multiply, and then go out um, and exercise dominion over the earth and such. So we have this original blessing. But then what happens? Well, then there's the fall. And now, not only is the blessing lost, but now the earth is cursed. Remember what he tells Adam? Not cursed are human beings. Cursed is the ground because of you. Right? The human person who's supposed to be the mediator between the spiritual and the physical, when they fall, 
we bring it all down with us. And so now there's actually a curse that's on the world. And so our vocation is made that much more difficult. And then you read a little bit further, and there's kind of a return in Noah. Noah is blessed again by God, but not as universally. It's, it's a more subtle one, and I don't want to waste too much time getting into all the blessings. But Noah is blessed, but immediately afterwards, just like before, we have another fall with a curse. Right? Noah is actually a repeat of Adam and Eve. Right? Adam and Eve fail in the garden and sin and are cursed. Noah gets drunk so in a vineyard. Again, it's fruit of the vine fruit and fruit of the, all this stuff. He gets drunk and a curse occurs because of it. In this case, humanity is cursed, not by God, but by Noah. And he passes on half the blessing and a curse. So he curses one part of the human race, and he blesses the other, and then he leaves a third with no blessing or curse to choose their own way. So you have this story kind of um, brought forth um, of how this works itself out in history. Now the person who's blessed, the son of Noah who's blessed, his name is Shem. And Shem's name is important for um, a lot of things in the story. The first thing is the word Shem is a very strange name. The word Shem in Hebrew literally means name. That's what it means. Jews refer to God as Hashem, the name. Right? You can't, Jews do not pronounce the name. If they heard me saying Yahweh, they'd be extremely offended. You do not pronounce the divine name ever. So Jews today, and that was true in Jesus' time as well, although in that time they didn't refer to him as often as, the, as uh, Hashem, they called him Adonai, which means Lord. That's why by calling Jesus Lord, there's a connection between God and, and Jesus. But the point is, is Shem bears the name of God. And through his descendants, the blessing continues. The blessing will uh, fall forth, and this, but it's sort of a, it's sort of an, it's sort of a, um, in embryonic blessing. That is, there's a blessing given, but it doesn't actually begin to be fulfilled until much later, and that's in the person of Abraham. And in Abraham, we suddenly see um, the return of the blessing, so to speak, not just a blessing in general but the whole idea of what blessings do. So on page two, almost in the middle, you have this indented paragraph. And here's what God says to Abraham. It says, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your land, your relatives, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. The you is singular there. I'm blessing you, Abraham, personally. I will make your name great so you will be a blessing. That's different than the other ones. That one hasn't been since Adam. So not only does Abraham personally bless by God, Abraham becomes a source or instrument of God's blessing to everyone else, the whole human race. God will mention that in the next line. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Right? Everything hinges on our treatment of Abraham and his descendants. And then he makes the final promise at the end, which is Christ. All the families of the earth will find blessing in you. Um, now, the whole rest of the story of the Bible is right here. That's the three, the rest of the Bible. The great nation is the whole story of Moses. The great kingdom, the name, a great name is a kingdom, a dynasty. That's David. And the universal blessing is Christ. That's why we call ourselves as a church Catholic, which means universal. Um, so he continues to transfer this blessing to Isaac, to his son, Isaac's son Jacob, who is renamed Israel by God. 
And then Jacob gives it to the 12 tribes who are his sons and their descendants. So that's literally the people of Israel. And then when it comes to the people of Israel, the blessing is to be given every day by the priest. And so if you go down just a little further to the end of page, bottom of page two, now you have in the time of Moses and the 12 tribes, it says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron and his sons. So the high priests, not any Levite, the high priests, the ones who really represent the Lord. And tell them, this is how you shall bless the Israelites. Say to them, and no, it's not an Irish blessing. It came from here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. So shall they invoke my name upon the Israelites, and I will bless them. So there's a lot of ways. You can either look at the story of the Bible as a succession of covenants, from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses to David to Christ, or intimately connected to that, you could see the whole story of um, the Bible as the continuation of the primordial blessing God gave Adam for the whole human race to be finally restored and then even elevated in Jesus. And it's just the storyline of the line of blessing, quite literally. It's the family line of blessing. Because at each stage, someone is rejected, right? Isaac, who's second born, is chosen instead of Ishmael. Jacob is chosen over Esau, right? At each step along the way, there's a separation made of where the blessing, the line will come from. And ultimately, for us as Christians, it'll be culminated through Jesus of the tribe of David, born an Israelite himself. So we have sort of this whole storyline. Now, going back to the name for a moment, Hashem. This is where this term is where the term Semitic comes from. The Semitic people are the people who bear God's name. Who are the Semitic people? They're everyone descended from Abraham. And Jews are only one of nine, ten groups. You have the Arabs, the Jews, and there's nine, eight others that I can't recall right now. All Middle Eastern peoples. To be anti-Semitic is to call down the curse of God upon you. The church is very clear about that. That's what it means when he says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So um, this is... You know, there's a, a lot that runs through this as well and explains, even in the Christian context, why Judaism has suffered so much its whole life. Because in a sense, it bears the weight of the world as it's carrying this blessing through um, to its fulfillment. So blessings kind of stand at the heart of what sacramentals are. Because every one of these objects, um, and I'll just place them out here while I'm talking so when I look at them later, I can just talk about them. But every one of them usually is connected to some kind of blessing. Um, you bless yourself when you put holy water on. You usually may have a blessing or you aid your assist in prayer when you light these candles, the prayer cards, uh, the rosary, whatever these different things are, we're invoking these blessings. And when we get to Jesus himself, we see that he himself is a person who blesses things, right? He blesses people. So he blesses Simon Peter. He blesses the women who are following him, weeping. He blesses the children. Don't, you know, let, he brings, let the children come to me. He lays his hands and blesses them. Um, he blesses food, right? The loaves, the fishes, all the meals he's at. He consecrates the apostles. He promises divine blessings on people who seek the kingdom of God, etc. And so what we see in Jesus is he becomes, in a sense, the living blessing that God has bestowed upon the world. And then Jesus shares, even in his own earthly lifetime, begins to share that power of blessing with the apostles. So we're told, he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them to preach. Notice, those 12 are to be with him. They have a closer relationship than any of the other ones who are part of Jesus' group. They're his true inner circle. 
and he wants them with him so that they can sort of imitate everything he does. Since the fall of Adam had resulted in the cursing of the earth, Jesus now restores creation's original blessing. As I mentioned in the beginning, this incarnational principle. By God literally becoming one of his own creatures, in a sense, he has infused divinity into the physical world. So that instead of being cursed, everything that exists can become a blessing. Um, and Jesus is the one to start that. So that's why, for example, in Paul, is just one example, um, on page three, the first full paragraph near the end, he says, this is Paul, he says, quote, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected when received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the inv invocation of God in prayer. That's a blessing. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. And sacramentals help you and I and the Catholic Church in general to fulfill that mission. Um, the thing is, is because so many of us Christians, whether Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, even whatever, don't really grasp the whole big storyline. We know big points in the story. We miss things. So for example, you could read this statement by Paul a hundred times and you might just think he's referring to, oh, you should say a prayer before eating food, right? No, he means so much more than that, right? He's going back to Genesis, why everything is good. So it's been restored to Genesis um, goodness um, by Christ. Nothing is to be rejected, notice, nothing. But it's you and I who become the instrument of God's goodness in this world because our blessing is sort of required to bring it sort of out of this neutral place into the light of Christ, so to speak. We sanctify things by our words, our actions, etc. So we have this huge role to play that, God, that um, Paul is mentioning here, of which the blessings are a part. Um, so again, stepping back again to the incarnational principle, just really briefly, or the incarnational principle is the foundational dogma of Christianity. That's what makes a person a Christian. There are a lot of people who believe in Jesus but do not believe him the divine son of God. And they are not and cannot by definition be Christians. Right? So Muslims believe he's a prophet. Uh, at least the Dalai Lama and his school of Buddhist thought considered him to be a bodhisattva, a saintful man, a saintly man. Um, none of those people are and cannot be Christian. The distinctive sign of being Christian is the incarnation. So uh, the bold, last bold line on page three from the catechism, quote, belief in the true incarnation of the Son of God is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. That's what makes a person Christian in their faith side. On the other side, it's the baptism as well. And then they quote, the catechism quotes St. John, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So the incarnation is, is the be all and end all of everything we understand as Christians. We wouldn't know there was a Trinity if the incarnation hadn't existed, right? It's Jesus who reveals that he's the son of a father and he releases a Holy Spirit on us. So the incarnation stands as sort of the central reality of who we are as, as Christians. Um, and this whole story of Jesus is this ultimate story of God loving his creation so much, he literally becomes a part of it at some point. And so if you turn to page four, the famous beginning of John's gospel, we see this. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things to came, came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Unfortunately, there's a lot we can't that the English can't capture 
um, from the original. But um, in this whole statement of the word being with God and was God, the Greek language used is, is a um, action verb. What it means is the word is constantly moving in, in the direction of the Father. He's already is like the Father, but he's constantly moving. Um, you get the understanding of the great, the, the sort of the Trinitarian dance. Um, the Greek term for the, how the Trinity relates is this weird term, perichoresis. Don't have to memorize that. But I'm only pointing it out because it's interesting for what it means. This is where we get the word choreography. Choreography is a dance. What's the best way we can explain how the Trinity relates is that it dances together in and out of one another in this ultimate dance. So hence the Irish song, The Lord of the Dance. One of them takes human form now and now brings humanity into the dance of God. So there, there's a, a long tradition that goes with this. Now, why did the other thing that's interesting it says is made as dwelling. The word dwelling is literally tabernacle. So it's drawing connection to the Old Testament where God was present in the tabernacle. And for us as Catholics, he's present again in what we our tabernacle. But it literally says he tabernacled himself among us. The other thing that's important is, and John's not the only one to say, say this, Paul does, the book of Hebrew does, or several places, but notice Jesus is the Father's blueprint or instrument of all creation. Notice, all things, pan omnia, all things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. Right? He's the very blueprint. Everything in, in creation bears the stamp of the incarnate son already before he even becomes incarnate. Human beings are the highest level. We're images, and we're called to become likenesses to our spirituality. So why did he become flesh? Well, just real briefly, to reconcile us to God, of course, but more importantly, to empower us to become what Peter says, partakers of the divine nature to literally share in God's own life in some way. Um, he enables us to know the love of the Father, and he's the, he is the model of holiness. And in, in this, it's important to realize what we're saying about Jesus when we talk about Jesus as God and man. When, when the church says that Jesus is the model of holiness, that means two things. On the one hand, he tells us what God is like. Some people in their spirituality are a little skewed. And what I mean by that is they understand or reflect about the Father differently than they do Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus is nice, forgiving, compassionate, loving. The Father's kind of stern, harsh. Cross every T, dot every I. Not at all. What is, re remember, there are three titles that they give Jesus in the New Testament to describe him coming from God. One is the Son of God. One is the Word. And the other one with a capital I is he is the image. Right? He's the image. In a sense, we're copies of the copy in our image of God. He's the image. He's the perfect image of everything the Father is. And think about Jesus himself at the Last or uh, yeah, at the Last Supper. And remember, Thomas is getting a little nervous because he can begin to see that the end is something's coming big. And he says, Jesus, if you just show us the Father, we'd be all right. And what does Jesus say? Have I not been with you three years, Thomas, and you still don't get it? If you see me, you see the Father. Right? I and the Father are one. God the Father is no different than Jesus. Jesus is who he is as the Son of God because he perfectly reflects the Father who is loving, compassionate, etc. Remember when the Bible says God is love, that's referring to the Father. The term God in the New Testament is never used of Jesus himself or the Spirit. They're always called the Spirit or the Son or whatever. When it ever, if it just has the word God by itself, 
it always refers to the Father. Right? It's the same with our creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. It's not I believe in God, comma, the Father Almighty. The Father Almighty is God, and then God has two hands, the Son and the Spirit. But the point being, he shows us who God is. When we look at Jesus, when we receive him in the Eucharist, when we hear the, 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 the homily at Mass, when we read the scriptures, where we connect with him in prayer, we discover who God is really like. We see him portrayed in the Gospels, the one who bends down to help others, the one who gives his life on behalf of us, the one who does all these kind of things. So he shows us who God is. However, because he's the perfect human, the new Adam, he shows us who we are. In other words, he also shows us what a human being is supposed to be like. The, the, the irony, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, is it's the exact same thing. If you and I are made in the image of God, that means everything we do must reflect and be an image of God. So it's only by knowing who God is we can know who we are and how we're supposed to live and act. So Jesus brings that all into one because he is truly God and truly man. 100% God, 100% man, both. He's not half and half. He's not a mixture. He's 100% of each. So as the model, Jesus stands as, as everything we know about the Father and God, as well as everything we know that we're called to be and live, etc., so in Jesus, as I've mentioned, everything has been united. By becoming flesh, God has entered literally into the DNA of his own creation. And so now all of creation has this special presence of the Lord. Spirit and matter, heaven and earth, the supernatural and the natural, God and man. Everything becomes a sign of and can communicate God's presence. Right? We sing that at Christmas a lot. Um, God and sinners reconciled. All those terms and those words have a much deeper meaning if we really reflect on them. So the incarnational principle has three basic components, three things it tells us. This is right in the middle of page four. Number one, the first component of this principle that God became a human being is sacramentality, hence where we get the word sacrament, sacramental. What does that mean? It means because of what Jesus did, God is present in all things so that the visible, tangible, finite, and historical people, events, places, and objects can become actual, are actual and can be potential carriers of the divine presence in and through whom we encounter the invisible God. Now it has that weird phrase, actual and potential. God's presence is actually there. Whether we personally have the potential to experience it depends on our sinfulness or our graced moment, but he's there. But the point is, is everything can become something the church uses. So candles, water, right? Um, in baptism, you have blessed water, a sacramental. But then in the actual rite of baptism, God's presence comes on truly changes that person that they really become a son or daughter of God supernaturally. They come out of the water. There's something new that God has done. The water has been the transforming object. And then after the sacrament is over, the water's just blessed water again. And so God uses these things in order to bring his presence about. But even more than that, not only does can he be seen, so to speak, or encountered in these historical realities, but the second one is called mediation. So not only can we see that he's present once we reach a certain spiritual level, but we can see that he actually works in and through that reality in an objective way. And so again, we have that's the sacraments, right? When that water is, is poured over the child or the adult or whether they're submerged in it, um, they are truly changed, right? When the priest takes that unleavened bread and that alcoholic wine and he consecrates them, they truly become 
the body and blood of Christ, right? Think, I mean, that in itself, um, the whole idea of the Eucharist blew Francis of Assisi's mind, right? Because when he really reflected on that, several things came to mind. Francis said, well, think about how humble God is because he allows an unworthy priest, because even the most holy priest is unworthy in this sense. He allows the most unworthy priest to call him down from heaven at any time he just he desires and God answers always comes at the same time he thinks why if you it also shows the humility of God because why wouldn't you have if you from our view of what we think maybe God should be like why wouldn't you have come down why wouldn't you appear to the church now as something super powerful and obvious instead you appear as bread which, let's be honest, half the time doesn't even taste good, right? It, because they leave it and it's unpacked, you know. You're like, that's God? Yeah. That's part of the mystery of the incarnation, right? That physical things become, in that case, literally becomes the, our God. And that leads to the third one, communion. So not only is God present in all things, sacramentality, not only can we encounter him and experience them, like he works through those things, he's not just there for us to see, he's working, but we also encounter him in an ex and experience him especially in a communal way, in a community of faith. The more of us there are, the greater the presence of God that can be, in a sense, experienced. So while I might have great experiences in my own personal prayer life and such, um, on the emotional level and such, in a true spiritual action, when I am there at the Mass with all those other people, praying together, the, the priest there uniting those prayers, that's why it's called a collect, the opening prayer. He collects us all to be one voice. Um, that power is much more, that, that prayer is much more powerful, both sending it to God and also what we receive in turn. Um, if you read the story of Genesis, you see this in what's really a strange story if you think about it. Because in, the, in chapter 2, uh, chapter 1 and 2, God creates Adam. And then, right, remember, up to this point, everything was good. This is good, 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 good. And you've, you've had seven goods listed. And then God is there. Adam is with God. Now, don't forget that. Adam is already with God, and he already is in Eden the perfect place. And yet, though Adam is with God, God is the one who says, it is not good that the man should be alone. And he creates the woman, right? The point being, even God is experienced better and more intimately in communion with others, not just me and God, but we and God. And so that's very much the Catholic understanding. It's very Jewish too, right? It flows from Judaism. That is why, for example, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox churches are the only churches that have that you have to attend service every week. You must come and publicly declare yourself with others. It flows from that understanding that together something happens that can't happen uh, just with me and God. In, in ourselves. So um, the incarnation has really done all of this. And I already explained the bottom part where Christ is human and divine, the church is human and divine, the scriptures, the sacraments. So where do the sacramentals fit in then? So where are these things called sacramentals? Where, well, they're derived from the same idea. The sacramentals, in a sense, take the grace of the sacraments and they extend them beyond the liturgy into every part of our ordinary life. Um, and at this point, it's very important, as I point out here, we have to be very clear that the sacramentals are never to be considered something like a good luck charm or as if they impart some magical effect. If I do X, I'm going to get Y no matter what. Um, to do so is to warp them from the actions and objects that help actually inspire and direct us into deeper faith and love and warp that into kind of this vain superstition and such. Um, 
so for example, here's one that the church has commented on in its, um, it released a, it's probably been a decade or more now, but a release, it's called the Directory on Popular Devotions from the Vatican. And it discusses all of the universal devotions you think of. And when it comes to the scapular, it specifically says this. The church accepts no promises of the rosary, scapular, or otherwise as an article of faith. And in fact, the church knows that no sacramental has the power to do what it claims unless the person has the faith prerequisite to do that. So example, one of the promises of the scapular is if you're wearing the scapular at the moment of death, you're going to go to heaven. Right? Well, no. <laughs> if you're a great sinner and you don't repent, wearing the scapular cannot substitute for a sacrament, which is power. And it can't substitute for a lack of faith that you have. And it tells the story, I forget which saint it was, tells the story of a sailor who lived a life like that and used sacramental superstitiously and he wore a scapular. I have a scapular on so I keep touching it because I'm talking about it. But anyway, he, um, so he falls off the boat and he realizes he's drowning, he's not going to be saved. But he feels okay, except then the next wave knocks the scapular off of him, right? But what that story is trying to highlight is scapulars aren't magic, and to treat them in a magical way is to misunderstand the scapular. Will it fulfill its promise if you are if you are you know believe in Christ and all these things? Yes, then it will. But it can't substitute for your faith or for the power of sacraments. It's simply an extension of them. And if you don't have the faith, as we're going to see, sacraments have no sacramentals. Excuse me, have no power whatsoever. So it's very much based on us because unlike the seven sacraments which produce grace of themselves, they actually cause grace to occur. The sacraments are efficacious, that means they work, only to the extent of the fidelity and devotion of the person who does them. And not only does it extend that way, it means that you and I do not receive whatever grace can come from a sacramental in the same way. We could all be praying the rosary, but the person with the greatest faith is going to get the most grace out of that because it's ba a rosary is a sacramental and it's based on our faith. And so the more faithful I am in doing it, the more the response I'm going to have spiritually from God. So sacramentals are different because they are dependent upon us. Sacraments are not. Um, now, just like sacramentals, ultimately, ev or everything, sacraments, sacramentals, all of them ultimately come from the power of Christ. That's clear. But the way they occur is slightly different. Um, and maybe a, the best way to do this is do a little just comparison of a sacrament and a sacramental. And there are four main differences that help us understand the, the distinction between the two of them. So um, if you turn actually to page six, the hash marks, two are on this page and two are on the next page, um, determine the four different things. So the first one, the seven sacraments were instituted by Jesus Christ arising from various incidents in his life. So the sacraments trace themselves directly to Jesus himself. Right? Jesus was baptized, so we have the sacrament of baptism that he then directs the church. Jesus was present at the wedding in Cana, so we have the sacrament of marriage. Jesus anointed people and healed them. Jesus forgave. All these things are things Jesus himself did. And sometimes he explicitly Form those sacraments. And if not him, um, at least if not by his very words, by his actions that then the church understands later through the Holy Spirit. So for example, Jesus heals the sick. He commands them to take oil in the book of Mark and go out and anoint the sick and heal them. So there you have the sacrament of anointing. But then to make it clear in the letter of James, James specifically tells that only the presbyters, the priests can anoint and such like this. But sacraments come from Jesus. Sacramentals, however, are instituted by the church. 
So drawing on the power Jesus has given us, the church to regulate it, the society of the Christians, the church is the one who determines sacramentals. In a sense, we recognize sacraments, right? Because they're already of Jesus. We just says, yes, that's one of the sacraments. Sacramentals, we can have as many as we want. We can, the church can determine whatever it needs for a given culture, time, period, etc. Number two, this is the big one, really. The seven sacraments objectively confer divine grace upon the recipient simply by virtue of the rite itself. In terminology, uh, it's called ex opere operato. And this is given in the footnotes. Basically, it, in Latin, it simply means by the work done. So, so long as the correct formula, the words are said, so long as the correct actions are done, that sacrament conveys grace. That doesn't mean the person receiving the sacrament receives grace. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, when the priest consecrates that body and blood, it is the body and blood. It's not a symbol of it. It is it, period. However, if a person receives it but doesn't believe in it, they don't receive any benefit from it. They have it. If you'd like to think of it this way, one of my professors says it's like an uncashed check. I possess it. Like, in other words, they have the grace. It's in their body. But because they don't believe it, they haven't cashed the check, they don't have any access to it. So don't take this to mean like it's magical either. It's, it's not. It's based on Jesus' um, fidelity to the church. He's going to have the sacraments do what they're supposed to do. But whether the person accepts it or not is is important as well. Um, so don't sort of lose sight of that. It's, the church isn't saying that just because it happens, that means the person will be affected. They may not be. In this sense, however, it's very different because when a sacrament is used, it depends entirely upon the recipient and the church's prayer. So the church's prayer and the faith of the recipient are what are what um, empower, so to speak, the sacramentals. So it comes from a very different place. It's it's not nearly as powerful as the sacraments are. Um, number three. The sacraments could only work on living human beings. Right. All of the sacraments are are. Only for humans. I remember my first sacramental sacrament class. Our priest asked us, you know, he talked about, you know, in the Middle Ages, the tabernacles aren't like as secure as they are today. So what if a mouse broke in and ate the host? Would it have the body of Christ? And almost all of us, because we were thinking of this, said, yeah, sure. And he's like, no, they can't. Because the mouse doesn't have the requisite nature to receive a sacrament. So it can't have it. There is no sacrament. Only human beings can receive sacraments. Sacramentals, however, can extend to anything in nature, animate or inanimate. So, I mean, think of it. You, we know this, right? You wear a blessed metal. That's inanimate. You use a blessed candle. Inanimate. You bless pets on St. Francis Day. Animate, but not human. And so on and so forth. Um, we're at our break, but let me just finish these four, and then we'll, we'll move. The other one, and I, I, pastorally, this one, the church handles in different ways. Once a person is physically deceased, the sacraments don't work on them anymore. Right? There's no human person here. Their, their soul is gone. Now, um, in Catholic hospitals, every person who works there is deputized to be able to baptize a dying person, generally an infant, but are deputized to do that. Um, now, pastorally, if an infant dies um, or a person dies without receiving the last rites, the priest sort of makes a judgment call. Technically, the sacrament can do nothing for them. But depending on the priest, how close to the time of death we're talking, etc., the priest, for a pastoral reason and to make the parents feel better, may 
baptize that baby, more often they'll just bless it. Or that person who they weren't able to get to before the, the, um, the last rites were given. But technically speaking, it can't do anything for them, not the sacrament itself. The prayer of the church still can, the mercy of Christ, etc. But the sacrament itself is, 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 is unable to be given to anyone except a living human person. And then the fourth one, a major difference, is um, sacraments are necessary for salvation, right? They're commanded by God. For our salvation. Sacraments are not at all. Sacraments are recommended or encouraged to help us grow in faith. But they themselves can't save us because they don't produce um, the grace that the sacraments do. So, um, and sacraments were spend two sessions on because there's a lot to talk about them in general but the sacramentals are instituted by the church so there is no list of them if you ask what are all the sacramentals nobody knows um, some have been fallen away out of use over time some still exist there are some that have been around for a long time called the universal ones but the church can create sacraments whenever it wants and in fact all sacramentals well, sacramentals sorry whenever it wants the Pope is the ultimate arbiter of that. At least for the last several popes, the popes have given that power unilaterally to any bishop to exercise. So a bishop, or at least the, UC, the, the USCCB in our case, could determine sacramentals just for the United States without having to ask the Vatican. Um, and so we have, they're, they're constantly being kind of cre created as needed, so to speak, to help the faithful. Um, again, it's very important that the sacramentals are based on our faith. They're very us-centered in our faith of where it's coming from, connected to the prayer of the church and blessing those objects so that they can be this instrument that our faith can connect with to God. Um, anything can be used as a sacramental. Uh, in principle, again, it has to be something the church okays. We, as laity, we don't make up our own sacramentals, but uh, anything the church chooses to incorporate can be blessed. And they are encouraged, their use, because they do help us to grow in faith. And so in a sense, they flow from the sacraments. And then if, if used properly, they kind of help us then receive the sacramental graces even more powerfully. So they kind of work in this, um, in this ongoing sort of increase of grace if we're using them properly and understanding them. The other one that goes back and forth about what people think, let me give you an example and then we'll take our break. Um, the one that a lot of clergy have an issue with is the little St. Joseph's that people bury in their yard to sell their house. Now, here's where the faith is very important. If I do that act and I'm doing it in a magical sense, I might not call it magic, but I think if I do X, Y, Z, God has to help me sell my house, that's a superstitious use of that object. And that actually falls under idolatry. Even though it's a small type, it's, it's a sin. If I do that though, and I don't expect that God will necessarily have to sell my house by bearing it, but by, by doing this action, by praying and inter asking Joseph to intercede for me, by really coming at it at a place of faith and leaving it up to God, well, then the exact same act can be sacramental, right? It can be something that I get. Even if my house doesn't get sold, which it may, though, I can get some grace out of that. So sometimes it's not even the object itself that's the problem. It's our faith when we approach these things, right? And that can be used for anything. Um, these are from our sacristy. On St. Blaise Day, we bless throats. They bless throats. And so the candles are blessed first, and then as each person comes forward, you know, they put it here to bless people and such. And so in the same way, it can be very, it can be received in a superstitious sense, and then it's not going to have any effect, at least any good one for the person. Or it can be received with faith. And even if you don't have any throat injuries, it's just placing that faith in God. Um, 
you know, realizing that God can work and do anything as the omnipotent one who works through everything in the world. Um, every action, even if it's not one that the person themselves specifically has need of, what it represents, you still have blessings and grace about that, right? I mean, when I bless animals on the um, St. On the, uh, uh, St. Francis Day when we do that, um, I'm not guaranteeing to anyone your animal's not going to die when it like leaves the room or something. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, we had one of the birds fly away <laughs> right after it got blessed because the little kid opened the cage and so. <laughs> so anyway, let's go ahead and take, oh, yeah. Uh, what happens <clears throat> technically when the sacrament is not done correctly, the verb would you want Oh, if the sacrament, sacrament is not done correctly, uh, then it doesn't, it doesn't have an effect. Um, generally speaking, we understand that broadly. For example, if the, priest in, in, if the priest in saying the words of institution or the words stumbles a little bit, and then, that's fine. Um, that's different than, for example, some of you may have heard the priest who baptized a lot of people purposely, intentionally with the words, one change in word, we baptize you. Now the church is undergoing a, a nightmare of having to track every person that priest baptized because none of them are baptized. None of them are. That's different because the priest stands in the person of Christ. It is Christ who baptizes all of us through the priest. By changing the word to we, maybe he thought, giving him the benefit of the doubt, he was being very inclusive of the community, but he changed the sacrament to the point where it, it is not effective. So that would not be effective. Or if you use the material, um, Monsignor couldn't like pull out, uh, you know, um, cheese its and say the words over it and it become the Eucharist. It just wouldn't. So that's why, for example, at like some evangelical churches that have those little like, they look like Tic Tacs, but they're some kind of bread <laughs> and they give you just grape juice in like little cups, that could never be the Eucharist. Even if a priest said words over it, it couldn't be the Eucharist, because that's not alcoholic wine, maybe the bread's unleavened. But, so it has to be the correct matter and the correct form, formula, short for formula. Chris, but that's, that's very rare. Wouldn't the people who were baptized, though, at least have baptism by desire, even though the priest... They'd have, yeah, and, and just like in confession, if you go to confession and you confess a sin or you ask about a sin, and the priest tells you, no, that's not a sin, or don't worry about that, it's not really a sin, <laughs> but it objectively is. I mean, it, in that situation, the church says, unless you had reason to know that the priest is not telling the truth, like, I mean, some of us go to a confessor we know is going to be easy on us. That would not be, be counting. If you're going, I honestly don't know the answer. I said, this is what happened. I'm not sure if it's a sin or not, but I feel bad. And the priest says, oh, no, that's not a sin. Don't worry about it. Well, the church would say, because you went in good faith, you did celebrate the sacrament, and you have no reason to not think that that, sacri that, that confession was valid, that you don't have to worry. There's no guilt from that sin, um, per se. The same kind of thing would happen in the baptism. Are these people completely devoid of grace? No. They at least have grace of baptism by desire. Um, they even have more grace than that because they're living from a place of good intention and through no fault of their own or way they would necessarily know especially if they were infants who wouldn't know what was said over them um, yeah they still have grace it's it whether it's still baptism though and how close it approaches the power of the full sacrament is why the church still follows up and that that one guy caused a lot of problems in her and, and a lot of people annoyed too you can imagine you know i get calls the ones i usually get calls on her about godparents they're like, our godparents aren't even Catholic anymore, or they're horrible sinners now, and I want new godparents. Can I get new godparents put on the thing? And I'm like, nope. Once, once it's done, it's done. I mean, in that sense, what I tell them is, well, find someone who will be a real godparent in the sense of that's who will help guide your kid, but you can't change. Once it's done, it's done. You can't change any of that. Um, but this is very hard to break. That, that example with the we baptize you is a very rare thing because the church takes pains to make sure that, the, that human beings can't really screw up the sacraments that often. Um, 
because the church teaches and has from the early persecutions that even if the priest themselves is a the worst sinner or or doesn't believe themselves so long as they do what they're supposed to do through their holy orders that still takes place and it doesn't matter um, it may matter subjectively you know when you have people now who find out the priest who baptized them or gave them their first communion or married them has been uh, you know accused and found guilty of really horrendous crimes it doesn't affect their sacraments their sacraments are all valid it may hurt their view of the church. It may make them subjectively feel bad, but their sacraments are just as valid as anybody else's. And um, that's just um, the reality is God, for the most part, doesn't let us mess up his, his plan to that extent. So, okay, we took a long extended first part, guys. Let's take a break and then we'll come back. And... Did they pass the basket? I mean, you know, and there's, he just well, he can't, you can't use grape juice, no. It has to be alcoholic. In other words, it has to, for a, the, the, the four parts of a sacrament, not, this is kind of, we're not on sacraments, but just real briefly, there, there's four parts of a sacrament that make it legitimate or valid. Um, the, there is um, the matter, that is what is used, the words, or the, the matter of the things used, the objects. Um, the next is the form. It's short for the term formula, and that's the words used. Not the whole words. Like for the Mass, the only words we're talking about are the words of institution, not everything said from the opening prayer to the close. It's that one short part. Just like baptism, it's not the whole rite. It's I baptize you in the name of... So they're very specific and short, actually. And then you have the minister has to have the ability to do it, So some sacraments can be only performed by the bishop. Some, most can be performed by priests. A few can be um, performed by deacons. And some can even be performed by laity, usually in, in case of necessity. And then the recipient, the person who's receiving it, has to be, um, has, have to, has to have the, um, what's the term? Not the, the, dispose, they have to be disposed to be able to receive it. And that would be um, different for each one. So um, the matter, though, the matter has to be things that actually connect back to the real founding of the sacrament itself. So that's why um, it has to be the real bread and real alcoholic wine, because that's what was used at Passover. They didn't drink grape juice, which wasn't even invented yet. And they didn't eat other types of food um, in terms of the, the Eucharist part. It's why you can't baptize yourselves with sand and say the words. It has to be water and so on and so forth. So the matter itself has to convey that. Um, and usually there's a whole background to that. So it's not just Jesus saying, for example, the words of the Eucharist. It then goes back to um, bread and wine throughout the whole Bible from the book of Genesis on. We have Melchizedek who blesses. Abraham, that's where the, the blessing comes to Abraham, is actually through Melchizedek. And then he offers God, um, Melchizedek, a, a sacrifice of bread and wine. And then you have the showbread that was used in the temple that could only be eaten by priests. So there's a reason, it's not just what Jesus did, but even what Jesus does is the culmination of a whole thing. So that's why the matter is important. And then the formula are the words. Um, and it's not the word, the words are important not because they're magical. The words are important for us because if, if the words aren't said correctly or the words aren't said at all, then we don't really have any idea what's going on. It's for us to be able to participate. You know, so if I had like a pitcher of water and I went over and I poured it on Dave three times and walked back, you'd all be like, what's wrong with Chris, right? <laughs> now, if I walked over and I poured, I said, I baptize you in the name of, you'd still be like, what's wrong with Chris? But you'd all know what I just did, right? I baptized him. So the words are not magic in that sense, why it has to be the right words, but it has to correspond to what Jesus said, and it has to be said aloud so that we can be part of the celebration. Then again, the minister, like I mentioned, some have the ability to... Um, the bishop is the high priest, so he can do every sacrament. 
and he's the only one who can do every sacrament. Priests are extensions of the bishop. They're his delegates. So they can do most of them, but there's some they can't do. Um, they can't ordain anyone, not even a deacon, and they can't um, uh, usually perform confirmation. So usually they have five that they can do. Then deacons are interesting because deacons can only do two. You know what two a deacon does? Marriage, <coughs> Marriage and baptism. baptism. In a sense, deacons in this sense are no different than lay people. And the reason I say that is any lay person can baptize. You shouldn't in case, unless it's an emergency. And the deacon is only there at the wedding as an observer, but the actual giver of the sacrament of marriage is who? The people. The, people. the, the husband gives it to the wife, the wife gives it to the husband. <laughs> The priest, deacon, or bishop is just there as a witness. So in a sense, deacons really can't do almost anything other than what an ordinary layperson could. They just can do it officially in the way it happens. Um, yeah, the, the baptism one is the problem. Working in religious ed for so long is, you know, you'll have a baby born, and mom and dad aren't on board so much with religion, but grandma is. And so one day she's watching the infant and baptizes it in the sink or something, right? And then they tell me. Because grandma, a few years later, finally convinces mom and dad to get on board. And they're like, okay. And then in the conversation, she tells me that the baby's baptized. That baby can't be baptized again at all. I can do the ceremony, and they can do the anointing and everything, but they will not baptize that baby um, because you can't be born again one, uh, more than once, just like you're not born naturally. Right? We don't believe in reincarnation, so... One time for each. You can't be reborn multiple times spiritually. So that, that is where I've seen that most happen, is someone jumps the gun because they're afraid that the parents aren't going to do what they should be doing. And then later, when the parents kind of have a change of heart, it's a little too late by then so for, the, for the actual ceremony. Um, so there has to be the spiritual part. And then the recipient has to be disposed. Generally disposed for most of the sacraments just means you have to be in the state of grace. So for the big ones, like before you receive confirmation, before you're ordained, before you get married, um, usually those people are, are directed, like we direct the con adult confirmation people, they have to go to confession, and I have to know that they went um, so that they're in the state of grace. Two sacraments, however, you just have the disposition is just a willingness to be there and belief that the sacrament will work. Um, that's baptism, because by definition, you can't be in the state of grace because you haven't been baptized yet. You're still in original sin. So baptism, so it's just the desire. If it's an adult, it's the desire of the person themselves. If it's a child, it's the desire of the parents and godparents in bringing them there. Um, and then for the other one is, of course, the sacrament of reconciliation. Now, you might go to reconciliation and you're in the state of grace because you've only have some venial sin, smaller sins on you. But the sacrament is actually mainly focused on mortal sin, which, of course, wipes away the state of grace. So you can't be in that. But the very fact you're there in goodwill and such is the disposition needed. So there's a little bit of difference of the different, slight differences in who can do it, what the disposition requires. But otherwise, those are the four things that make a sacrament valid. Um, Valid or invalid? If a sacrament is invalid, like the guy who said, we baptize you, then it's invalid, and by definition, it didn't. there was no sacramental grace given. You'll also hear the term, again, I don't want to get too far afield, but you'll also hear the term licit and illicit. That simply means something can be illicit but still valid. That's grandma's baptism. That baptism is valid. The kid got their sacramental graces at that moment, but it was illicit. In other words, it wasn't done in the correct manner it should have been. It doesn't destroy the sacrament, but it, it's what people shouldn't act that way because they can begin to demean or take away from the, the sacrament um, itself. Okay, back to sacramentals. Um, Right on, on page 7, 
Uh, right in the middle, there's a, um, or right after the, the hash marks, I should say. Uh, actually, that's, I want to make a change. Let's jump back for one second to page five, and then we'll jump back to page seven. Um, writing in the 1800s, so this is old. This shows you how, how far back a lot of these ideas and things go. Writing in the 1800s, and a French-American priest, uh, Father Lowe, wrote a four-volume set of, called A Course in Religion. And in the second book, had to do with the Mass and the Sacraments. Uh, you can still get his book through Tan Publishing. But he's writing in the 1800s, but he writes, you know, kind of explaining what sacramentals are. So right near the bottom of page five, the indented paragraph, uh, Father Lowe says, it may be asked how water or metals or candles or scapulars can possibly help us on the way to heaven. In themselves, these objects have no such power, and it would be superstition to attribute such power to them. But they tend to excite good dispositions in those who use them rightly. Or right. They excite increased fear and love of God and hatred of sin, and because of these movements of the heart towards God, they remit venial sin. They have a special efficacy because the church has blessed them with prayer. And so there is surely no superstition in believing that if the church prays that in the sight or use of blessed objects may excite good desires in her children, God will listen to these prayers and touch in a special way the hearts of those who use them aright. So he explains, you know, like I've been saying, the sacramentals themselves don't possess a power in and of themselves. But through the blessing of the church, these things become recognized instruments by which you and I can use to help increase our faith and charity. And so because we have the power of the church's prayer behind it, we know that we can use them safely and effectively if we're using them in the correct manner with faith. Now the more modern statement written from the catechism is on page seven, right near in the middle it says, Sacramentals do not confer the grace of the Holy Spirit the way sacraments do. But just like Father Lowe said 200 years ago, but by the church's prayer, they prepare us to receive grace and dispose us to cooperate with it. And then this last line opens up sort of the door to show you how anything can be turned into a sacramental by the church. There is scarcely any proper use of material things which cannot be thus directed toward the sanctification of man and the praise of God. Now, um, when the, an object is blessed then, like a rosary or my scapular or you know, like a little crucifix like this, um, the the object itself does not become the cause of grace the way a sacrament is, right? If this was the blessed Eucharist sitting here, it's full of grace by its very nature. This is not. Um, instead, what it is, is it's almost like you step into a blessing, right? The church has already preceded your use of this object with a prayer in its intercessory power and prayer. And so through the power of the church's prayer, when you use this, you look at it, or you pray with it, or whatever it is that you're using the particular thing through, God responds to your petition that much more easily and powerfully because it's already been added sort of to the prayer and request of the church and the full power of the church in doing that so that it can bestow these special graces when we're using them properly. So that's what the church mentions. Now, as I've said, now looking at some examples, there is no definitive list. You will never find a definitive, definitive list of all sacramentals because they're created according to the needs of the community. Because they derive from the church and not from Jesus himself, therefore the Pope is the final say exclusively on the right to establish or get rid of any sacramentals. However, as I, I mentioned during the break, Traditionally, the popes have granted the bishops and episcopal conferences the ability to institute sacraments that are appropriate to their specific cultures and situations. So here is sort of one of the requests. It says, top of page 8, in accordance with the bishops' pastoral decisions, 
They can also respond to the needs, culture, and special history of the Christian people of a particular region or time. They always include a prayer, so all sacramentals have to have a prayer at least to bring them into being if they're an object, or that the prayer itself accompanies the use of it, often accompanied by a specific sign, such as the laying on of hands, the sign of the cross, the sprinkling of holy water, etc. Now, below, I just chose a handful of some of the most common, ancient, going back some of them to the beginning of the church, and universal, that he's found anywhere in the world, um, sacramentals. But this is barely scratching the surface. There are many, many, many more. Uh, on my Monday class, a, a, a woman com came up afterwards and mentioned one, I couldn't even tell you what it was called now, that's used in India. Right? And it's probably very much connected to their culture and such that the United States wouldn't necessarily knew, know about, per se, except in the Indian community. And so it was one I'd never even heard of. I can't call, recall what it is now, but as it pointed out, the bishop can choose for their own culture, their own needs, things like that, that need to occur. So with that in mind, um, we'll now go over several, the rest of the pages are just very brief descriptions, with the exception of the blessing part, of several of the most popular and famous different types of sacramentals. It may surprise people because they don't think of it in the terms of a sacramental, but the most primary and foremost type, common type of sacramental is a blessing. Whether it's of an object, a place, a person, or an event, right? Blessings for meals, blessings for catechists, blessings over a, a sacred metal, blessings over or consecrations of a, of a space to bury someone, all these different things. So blessings are invocations of God's power, protection, and goodness. Um, and because you and I are Christians who have been blessed by the Father in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we, in turn, have the ability to also turn and help bless things in this world. There is a book, the official book is called, very unimaginatively, The Book of Blessings. Anyone can buy a copy. Now there is also one called the Shorter Book of Blessings, which is an abbreviated, much smaller group. Now in the Book of Blessings, there are blessings that only clergy can do. And then sometimes depending which clergy. For example, to, to consecrate an abbot or an abbess can only be done by a bishop. A priest couldn't do that. But so some are done by clergy, and then depending on which clergy are allowed to, bishop, priest, or deacon. Then some bless blessings are allowed by both clergy and laity. So there are a lot of blessings in this book that can be used by laity, by us. Generally what will happen is it will have the title of the blessing, and then if it's possible to be used by both, it will first have the, cler the, the cleric's version, and then immediately after that it will have, if said by a lay person, and it will have that version. So there are a lot of things that laity can bless. The basic rule of thumb is this. The closer the blessing has to do with the liturgy of the church, the more likely it's going to be only the clergy. The less that the, the, the particular blessing has to do with the, the liturgical life of the church, the more likely that laity are able to engage in that blessing. So when I used to oversee the little kids years ago, at Christmas time, I would pull out from the Book of Blessings and make photocopies for the families of the blessing of Christmas trees, the blessing of your creche, your, um, you know, um, the nativity scene, and the blessing of your home advent wreath. All those can be done by lay people, right? And there's a lot of ones in there. I highly recommend actually buying this book. Um, the shorter one, if you get the shorter one, I think, don't quote me on this because I'm not absolutely sure, but I think the shorter one only includes ones that can be said by both. So it might be a better deal. But why I recommend it, especially in the family setting, I think to kind of highlight 
on a daily or at least weekly basis sort of things about our faith and to connect God to things in our faith is, is so important, especially if there's younger people in the, in the family, in the home still, things like that. Because there's all kinds of blessings. There's blessings for pregnant women that can be given by their spouse. I mean, there's a formal one the clergy can give, but there's a one that the lay people can give. Blessings of meetings, blessings of food, um, bless, like everything you can possibly imagine. Like we have the ability to some extent, you can bless your own, if, you, um, if you're a farmer, you can bless your own fields. And there's things to do. You can bless your own home to an extent. So there's different blessings. And then there's some that really only laity have. And it's not that the clergy don't have them. They just refer to things that really either there's something so different in the way the clergy's version goes from the lay one that they, they sort of separate it. But, you know, blessings for the first day of school. Just going through the table of content shows you all the different things that the church has sort of put into our hands and reminded us of the power of laity, that we are also priestly people and we have the ability to give certain blessings um, based upon our who we are. So, for example, um, you know, Paul describing who we are, he says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Now, two points about blessings. An object becomes a sacramental only when it's been blessed by the church. Now, when it comes to any of these objects, because they're liturgically connected, these have, to be, these have to be clergy. But what that means is this. If I buy this at the store and I bring it home, I can still pray with it and everything else. It's fine. But it is not a sacramental. It doesn't become a sacramental till a clergy puts the formal blessing power of the church on this. So... Um, it has to be formally blessed in the blessing in order to actually become a sacramental. And, um, you know, there are different kinds of blessings because someone asked yesterday, like, if they bless my house, is everything in it blessed? Not exactly. A house blessing is a house blessing. But then if you wanted this crucifix blessed, this ble those would have to be done individually. Um, Someone asked, they owned a gift shop or work at a Catholic gift shop, and they said, you know, can, you, can the priest bless multiple things at once? I said, yeah, they can. If any of you have ever been at a consecration, that happens all the time, right? All the medals are put out for marrying consecration, and the priest blesses them all at one time, or maybe a bag of rosaries for kids. However, that woman couldn't have the priest come and bless it. You may not sell blessed objects. So the moment he blessed them, they couldn't sell them in that store. They'd have to give them away. Right? Now, don't people do all the time, yeah. illegally. If you're Catholic and doing it, it's a sin. Um, if any of you have ever seen St. Mary's um, uh, tabernacle, the um, uh, Adoration Chapel at St. Mary's in Escondido, they have the, the beautiful monstrance and stuff. That's, they have 24-hour adoration. On each side are huge glass cases filled with relics. Those relics were collected by a man named Clayton Bauer, who passed away several years ago now. Um, he collected those purposely by buying them off the internet because he knew they weren't supposed to be sold. So he did buy them to put them back into the possession of the church. So technically, you're not allowed to sell blessed objects. That's, what about candles, though? Um, yeah, well... Like the ones here you come and get and then have lit, those aren't blessed beforehand. <laughs> oh, because I know our church, they yeah. bless the candles and then they sell them. Sell them? I don't know. Uh, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to let them know. Not candles may be different because they, they're kind of, well, maybe because, maybe because they're, they, they fade away in time anyway. You're buying something that's kind of melts. disposable, right? It melts and such. Do you know, you have a... That could be. I mean, right. I mean, just like you can't pay for a sacrament, but we still give the priest money at weddings. But the wedding isn't actually the money isn't actually for the priest. It's, I mean, for the sacrament, it's for the priest. Um, yeah, the church is just very sim similarly. You know, people ask when it comes to one's uh, religious objects. Um, the easiest way is when you no longer have them, or they're destroyed in some way or broken. The easiest way is to give them to the bring them to the church, any church any Catholic church, 
don't bring them to me because I get so many boxes of stuff that I don't want or need. But, um, you know, some things can be burned. There, there's specific ways to do things. Like you're not really supposed to just throw away Bibles or anything like that. You're supposed to bring them to the church. Or if you just have tons, you know, I mean, people bring me 40 rosaries and different things at a time and St. Anthony prayer books because they're, they're collecting all these things from different groups. And we usually take those, and if we can't use them here by giving them to people in RCI and stuff, then we, we move them on to um, uh, Casa de los Pobres, the, the orphanage in Tijuana, and places like that. So there will be a place for them. There are specific ways to dispose of them. If, if anyone's interested, you can kind of look that up and see. But um, generally speaking, you're not just supposed to throw it away for the most part, um, especially if it's been blessed. Other ones are not as... as Okay, second part, there's a special subtype of blessing or type of blessing by, which sets a per particular person apart exclusively for God. That is called a consecration. It is a blessing, but it's of a different type because it takes that person, that place, that object from everyday use and devotes it entirely to God. So whenever a church like our church or any church before the first foundation is built, they bless that land. After the church is built, there'll be the bishop will come and he will anoint that whole altar with, with chrism oil. And then if you look at any church, it'll have four candles <coughs> set roughly at where the four walls of the church are, depending on how the church is. And that all comes from the, the, the consecration of the church when it was actually the building. So you first had the land, then the building. Um, the reason why sometimes there's issues at Catholic cemeteries about who can be buried there or not is because those Catholic cemeteries are consecrated ground. Um, so anything like that that's been set aside, those would be uh, places. Then objects, especially liturgical objects. Um, liturgical objects, if you, t if you use them for any other reason, they can no longer be used in the liturgy. So, you know, if a priest one day goes, hey, I'm going to take the goblet home with me, you know, my chalice, and I'm going to drink some beer out of it because it's big and I can hold more. Nope. Once he does that, that chalice can never be used again in the Mass or vestments or things like that. So they are literally set aside just for God. And to use them in any secular way then kind of diminishes that. With people, it, it depends on the type of consecration because um, uh, religious professions third orders like myself, but the nuns, the monks, etc., you are consecrated. Um, but then there's consecrations which um, are not as to that level. That would be the consecrations you do to the Sacred Heart, consecration to uh, Mary through Jesus and the De Montfort. Um, they set you aside, but you're still also living um, in, a, in your secular life, so to speak. Anyway, let's kind of move past blessings. Um, I've already pointed out different things can be blessed by different people. Now, not including holy water, because I made that its own category, not including holy water, the three most commonly blessed items would include, page nine, candles, salt, and ashes. Those would be the, the primary ones. There's a lot of other stuff. But candles can come in all different sizes, right? This is the kind that we give the, um, either at their baptism, whether in RCIA, if it's an adult, or when the children come. So there's the baptismal candle, which is blessed beforehand and then given to the family afterwards. There's just candles. Yes, you can buy a normal candle, you know, uh, um, religious candle or votive candle that the church can bless for you. A lot of times candles are used for very specific things. Uh, St. Blaise, as I mentioned, it's the blessing of the throat, but they bless the candle and then the candles sort of become the instrument of then blessing the throat. Um, on candle mass, they bless actual candles. You know, depending, some priests are more, more into those than others. And so depending on what parish you go to, you may or may not see the various times they come about. Blessed salt was once one of the most highly blessed objects today, not nearly as much. Um, the reason was in the, the pre-Vatican II church, Salt was blessed first, and then the salt was yet used to bless most other things. So, for holy water to become holy water prior to Vatican II's changes, the priest had to bless salt, and then he 
poured the blessed salt in the form of a cross over and into that holy water. And then that made the holy water holy water. So, um, and it was used in a lot of things uh, that it's not so much today. That's not how the, the rite goes today. So today, um, blessed salt would be, for the most part, the only way I'm familiar with it being used regularly. You can cook with it. I mean, bless your food in a special way that way. Um, but you, it often has its leftover part um, when it comes to dealing with spiritual evils. So it's used in the rite of exorcism. It's blessed in, by people and put around their home. Um, it's, it's used on altars and things. And so salt has this background from the Old Testament on of being, because it, it represents purity and something from the earth and all this, that it's sort of anathema to the fallen angels. So bless salt but much more popular in the past than it is today. Although I still know a lady who comes about once a month with a huge Morton's thing and has the bless it. So I don't know what she's doing, but she needs a lot of blessed salt. <laughs> then blessed ashes on Ash Wednesday, they're supposed to be made in as much as possible from the palms of the previous year's Palm Sunday. And then if you don't have those or you don't have enough to make enough ashes, then you can include other palms that you would then bless first and then bless the ashes. But they're, of course, given a special blessing. They're distributed on Ash Wednesday as a sign of penance. They help you experience contrition, give the desire to do penance. They can't actually have been blessed and used outside of Ash Wednesday. It's rare, but it can be done. The Franciscans, we use them sometimes when we're having extended penitential things. We'll ask a deacon or something to bless ashes for us. Those ones do not have to be made from the palms of Palm Sunday. Um, next, and this one surprises people, exorcism. Now, exorcism is not a sacrament, it's a sacramental. It's one of the oldest because it goes back to Christ himself and before. But an exorcism is a particular type of blessing, which is a public and authoritative prayer in the name of Christ that protects a person or object from the power of the devil and or is able to withdraw someone from the evil spirit's dominion. There are two types of exorcisms. The first type is called a simple or minor exorcism. You often, you'll often hear the term deliverance. That is not a technical term in the Catholic Church, but because it's become so widespread in the Christian world, it is now used by Catholics, including uh, some of the most um, popular is a weird word for it, but the known exorcists. Um, in the United States and elsewhere. Fortea, um, uh, Thomas, who the book, movie The Right was about. Um, we have, uh, there's several of them anyway. And they use the term now. Now, a minor exorcism can be performed in two ways. The official way is it, it's part of the rite of baptism. So in the baptismal rite, you have the three renunciations of evil. That is an exorcism. Right? Do, you, do you renounce Satan and all his empty show? All, you know, uh, the other place it takes, it, it's similar in the RCIA program, but it often occurred in the three weeks previous to the Easter vigil, where you came up and, and each one was a blessing of deliverance, was prayed over the people. The other way a, a simple or minor exorcism would occur was when a priest, a non-exorcist priest, because all priests are not exorcists, nor can they be. A non-exorcist priest or even a lay person um, prays usually with a group in order to help uh, free someone who's experiencing a de demonic, what's called obsession or oppression. Uh, I don't want to get big into these things because <laughs> one, they're kind of like more, they're kind of those weird, exciting things, but they're not really that important overall, but um, there are degrees <coughs> of influence that the demons can hold over someone. Now, the universal and 99% of the time one is simply that of temptation. That's what all of us experience. But when you start moving into where they're actually taking some kind of interactive mode in our life, you have <coughs> four levels. Uh, vexation, um, of 
session. Above this would just be the normal temptations that occur. And even most temptations aren't occurring to us because of actual demons in our vicinity. They're just, but they can. Um, and below this is integration. That means that's a person who's accepted it. They don't want to be cured of it. So within these four, what a minor exorcism can handle these two, or a deliverance. And basically the, the, what each one is very um, simply put, and then we can move on. Obsession is when the demons get in your head, sort of literally, in that they constantly barrage you with thoughts. Horrible thoughts, blasphemous thoughts, ongoing thoughts of suicide. The thoughts come from nowhere else. They keep people awake. They, it's unending. Um, of course, sometimes it's just a normal mental illness a person is experiencing too, which is why there's a very specific way in which these cases are looked at and treated when people come forth and say, they're possessed or whatever. But this one has to do with the mind. And then oppression has to do with the body. Um, when people are experiencing actual manifestations, um, scratch marks that appear out of nowhere, they're painful, coughing up weird items. Um, in extreme cases, people like the uh, cured uh, John Vianney, Padre Pio, would be physically thrown struck. That's all that. Minor exorcism deliverance can overcome those. The other two, ironically, the least part overall and, and the last one can only be done. Those are, that's a major or solemn exorcism. And they can only be done by two people. A bishop and an exorcist who is the priest that the bishop has formerly formally made their exorcist. Most dioceses have one. A few have two or three. A regular, any run-of-the-mill priest cannot do these. If they have anyone come to them, they refer them immediately to the, the pastoral center. They can do these kind. These ones are are big because in this case we have someone whose faculties have been really domin are dominated by it. And that requires um, a level of faith and power and such that to really meet that, that evil. This one more so because of what it affects. The weird word vexation is basically when demons manifest themselves not in human people but in things. So this would be the classic haunted house or not so haunted house, your house. But all of a sudden there's the sound of people walking or the sound of noises. And whenever you look over and over again, there's nothing, right? It's meant to start, what the whole point of this is, is meant to start to break down your mental state so it can flow. The other one is animals or objects. So yes. Just like we bless objects, objects can be cursed as well if they're used in specific things. Like I said, I don't want to get deep into this. We're right at the end of our time. Um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll just mention at this point is um, for all the fanfare and kind of excitement that goes around and surrounds exorcisms, um, most people know very little about them. I don't consider myself an expert by any means, but I... I do know the exorcist in our diocese. I've known him for a long time. His name is not to be said. Some, some let their name out, others do not. Um, and I know a lot of working in deliverance groups and such. The first mistake people make is exorcisms are never, a real full-blown exorcism is never a one-time in and out, you're done. That never happens, ever. It always occurs for weeks, months and in extreme cases years and if the person is unwilling to return to the sacraments and things themselves during it it will not take because the person in a sense is not helping to fight their own battle 
So the one is they're, they're a lot more extensive than people think. They take a long time, and there's a grueling process to even get into them because of the problem of, of misdiagnosis. So there's always the diocese has people who are, who are medical doctors, who are psychiatrists, who work with the exorcist, and they do a battery of tests to these people before they're ever referred to that level. Uh, the second thing is, despite all their supposed power and fanfare, exorcism is, and the exorcist themselves will tell you this, I've heard many of them do it. Exorcism is a sacramental, and therefore it is objectively weaker than any sacrament. In fact, the exorcists say, if a person receives the Eucharist and they're in a state of grace, they can't be touched by a demon, right? You have to sort of allow certain things to occur in the loss of your faith or the weakening of your faith before they even have the ability to approach you. And even then, it's very rare for them, for a Christian, because of the power of baptism, which is so much more powerful than an exorcism, the demons can't even, in a sense, do anything beyond that but tempt you, even if you're kind of not the best Christian, unless you actively seek out some way, knowingly or unknowingly, that gives them a in, right? uh, an entrance, they call it, a doorway. Um, anyway, we're at our time, but just really quick to flip through. Um, holy water, holy water is just ordinary water, been sanctified by the church. And then like the candles there, holy water is often used is blessed, and then it's often used as a blessing to bless other objects. So oftentimes, if the priest has time informally, they will bless the object that they're the object you bring for blessing. Crucifixes are powerful. Um, they help us focus ourselves on prayer. Also, when it comes to specific, again, the evil spirits, they tend to be one of the most powerful sacramentals in keeping the demons away. Um, the demons hate. The sign of Christ, which is the sign of their loss uh, and what has occurred to them. That's why even making the sign of the cross yourself in the form of the crucifix is, is so powerful. The rosary and the chaplets are all prayer bead sets that are used to help us in a formal, uh, form of mental or vocal prayer. The rosary, of course, centered on 15 different mysteries, 20 mysteries now in the lives of Jesus so that it can be, uh, uh, the same rosary can teach you vocal prayer, it can be used for meditation, and it can even move from meditation to contemplation for people who really are, are get into the prayer. The term chaplet, which means little crown, refers to any kind of set of beads. Some of them look just like rosaries. For example, the, um, the um, Divine Mercy one is just used on a normal rosary, any rosary thing. They have formal ones that have you know, the image and the red color, but other ones are completely different. So you have Chapel of St. Anthony, which is 13 sets of three beads. You have the uh, rosary of uh, the Art Lady of Sorrows, and that's se the, there are seven beads in each grouping of five. So they come in a wide variety of shapes, things, and basically they're all used to help us focus our devotional life to honor and ask for the intercession of God or of Mary or the angels or a saint or to reinforce a particular devotion like divine mercy or the sacred heart um, in help, to help us gain in the mystery of the faith. Last two that I mentioned, the scapular, and it's called a scapular because it's just worn over the front, over your neck, over the front and back. And the word scapula in Latin means shoulder, so it goes over your shoulder blades. Um, the scapular originally started as the habit of the Third Order Carmelites. And if you know any Third Order Carmelites, or if you are one, you know that your scapular is about this large. Right? You can't miss them when they wear them. Um, they're huge because they were meant to be the, quote, habit worn by the Third Order. Now, as time went on, they became more widespread, and they're worn by other people as well now, and they just help us to feel connected to Jesus or Christ. The Marian part of it always goes over the heart, with the prayer always going over the back. Uh, like chaplets, the main one is the, the brown rosary, the Carmelite one, but there's been green rosaries, blue, or scapulars, green scapulars, blue, so there's been a wide variety of them as well. And then we end with sort of any of the images, holy cards, 
fully pictures. You could even go to statues and even icons, which are kind of the highest level of a sacramental. The holy cards themselves were originally used only at funerals, uh, memento mori. They were um, remembrances of death. And they still are, right? You go to a lot of Catholic funerals, you get the prayer card on the back, the, their date of birth, death, maybe a prayer. As time went on, though, they became more widespread. And so today they're used for that, but they're also just used for personal devotion. They're used as gifts, as gestures of affection. They're used in all kinds of ways. So, sorry guys, we got all mashed up at the end and I kept you over, but it's because you got me talking about stuff, see? <laughs> but um, unfortunately, I will be gone next week. So I have to take another hiatus for a week. And then when I come back, we'll do the sacraments. That one will take two weeks because we really delve into the sacraments, which gets into the communion of saints and lots of other very core Catholic ideas. But um, yeah, pray for me. I'll be in Mammoth with my family for the whole time. <laughs> I love my daughters, but they're, they're, wonderful. they're at a fun age right now. That's all I'll say. They're at a fun age. 15, 13, and 10. So anyway, no, it'll be fun. But anyway, so I will miss next week, and then the week after we'll be back on track um, for it. And then this, this series will end pretty much at that point. Two or three more sessions is the most, and then I'll take a short break of a week or two, and I don't know what I'm going to do next yet. I'll, um, you can always email me if you have topics, and I pray over them and see what I, I feel like doing. Don't everyone say exorcism, but... Um, <laughs> Let's go ahead and end in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, who you sent among us as one of our own to become human, Lord, to reconcile us with yourself, to be our model of holiness, and to help us to enter into the very life of the Trinitarian mystery. We ask, Lord, that through the sacramentals that the church in its understanding of the Spirit has given us to use, the rosaries, the holy water, the blessings, the scapulars, all the various items, objects, prayers, and blessings that you give to us, that we will approach with appreciation and gratitude, that we'll approach with faith, and by using them, our faith will in fact grow even deeper and more intimate as they become instruments of grace between you and us by the power of the church's intercession on our behalf. Help to increase our faith, Lord. Help us to become ever more pleasing to you and give us the zeal and the discernment to be able to also preach your word and to be an example of holiness to this world so that the church can begin to once more draw all the human race into it to become the light of the world and the salt of the earth as we have been formed to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good week, you guys. Sorry again that I took a little longer, but I had to finish, so... <laughs>